So hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining our Zoom this afternoon. Um, before we start, I'd like to ask everybody if they could keep their microphones um, on mute. Um, the session is being recorded, so we'd like to limit extra noise as much as possible so it's not too distracting. Um, and if you guys have any questions for us throughout um, this Zoom meeting, um, <laughs> if you could submit them in the chat feature. Um, we'll answer them at the end of this uh, session. Um, so to start, my name is Eric Bonewald. Um, I'm a junior at Hobart and William Smith. I'm from New London, New Hampshire. Um, I'm double majoring in environmental science, environmental studies and architectural studies. Um, and we're excited to have you guys here to learn a little bit more about the environmental studies program. Um, other things that I'm involved with on campus is the HWS ski team. Um, I'm one of three captains on that. I'm a teaching assistant in the woodshop um, for architecture and studio classes. Um, and I've been involved in a couple of community-based research projects, um, two specifically with each of my advisors, um, Robin in a sustainable consumption class and my architecture advisor, Professor Blankenship, who I'm taking a sustainable community development capstone course with currently. Um, so I'm here today with Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies and Chair of Sustainable Community Development, Robin Lewis who is also my environmental studies um, advisor. So Professor Lewis, um, to get us started, if you could tell us a little bit about your background and some of the research you're currently working on or have been working on in the past. Sure, thanks everybody for joining us today and thanks to um, Eric for uh, doing the session with me. Eric and I've been working together for two years now. Um, and yeah. Uh, building quite a portfolio of uh, good projects out of out of our collaborations. Um, yeah, so my name's Robin Lewis. Um, I always tell students that they can call me Robin. Um, my dad was a professor, so when I hear Professor Lewis, I automatically like start turning my head and looking for him. Um, so feel free to call me Robin. Um, I am an assistant professor in environmental studies. Um, I've been here, this is my ninth year at the colleges. Um, I became chair of our sustainable community development um, program in 2014, um, and that's a position I still hold. Um, and so I can tell you a little bit more about both of those background wise. Um, I went to a liberal arts school. I went to Miami of Ohio, where I majored, double majored in botany and geography. Um, and so my, my graduate training is in the field of geography. For those of you um, who are wondering, it's about much more than maps. Um, it's a lot about thinking about the relationships between humans and the environment. Um, today, nine years in to working at HWS, a um, couple different research projects work in. Um, I do a lot with sustainability education in particular. Um, we have a first year seminar called Sustainable um, uh, Living. Um, and this is one of the more unique first year experiences. So I've been doing all of the assessments on sort of how students are um, responding to that program in our curriculum, as well as sort of social outcomes that I work along with the Office of Res Ed. Um, I also study mosses, had to get that in there. Um, actually, no, I study the people who study mosses. Um, happy to talk more about that, but I'll probably leave, leave that there. Eric's heard way too much. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned some of the work that we've done together, um, and we have spent a lot of time throughout the last two years. Um, and you've designed a couple of courses um, that are based on community um, research and community collaboration. Um, can you kind of explain a little bit more about the ways that student and faculty collaborate um, through advising and research? Sure. Um, so I'm a big fan. So when I was coming out of grad school looking for jobs, I wanted to be at a liberal arts school. And the reason I wanted that was based on my own experience of being able to work in a lab um, and um, that sort of stuff uh, while I was in college. And so HWS really uh, attracted me to come to it because there was a lot of opportunities. Um, you can do independent study projects. Um, you can do uh, what are called service learning based courses where you embed um, community based research in your courses. Come back to that in a minute. Um, 
I've had a number of students who've TA'd for me, courses that they've completed um, previously and come back and served in a peer mentor role. And I've had um, a series of, I think I'm getting my eighth and ninth research student, uh, summer research student coming up um, this summer. I have a first year um, who's gonna be working with me and then um, also a rising senior. Um, so there's lots of ways we collaborate. One of my favorite things to do is, as I said, to embed sort of like some sort of real world problem into the context of my courses. And so Eric mentioned, we've um, had a couple classes together by now, um, but the most recent one being um, my teach a class, an upper level class, small one, like 15 students on um, the relationship between sustainability, commodities and consumption. And in that class, we often um, partner with local businesses or nonprofits to do some sort of data collection for them to help them advance their efforts. Um, so over the course of the five times I've taught, I think we worked with 12 different um, local businesses. Um, most recently, and Eric, you can chime in whenever you want, um, worked with a group called Blueprint Geneva, which is offering um, the city of Geneva's first um, curbside compost pickup, as well as um, partnering with another organization, Closed Loop Systems, um, to provide more compost pickup for downtown. Eric, do you want to tell them a little bit about what you worked on? Uh, yeah, so that class was, you usually teach that in the spring, so that was last spring. Um, the class, I think there's probably about 15 of us. Um, we were split into three different groups and we were um, paired with Blueprint, like you said. Um, two of the groups, uh, one of the groups was looking at more of the business side of composting. So downtown businesses, um, how they're dealing with their waste streams. Um, are they composting? What are they doing that's environmentally friendly? Um, there's another group that was focused on do you remember the second one, Robin? Uh, was, branding, like the logo stuff. Oh, yeah. So kind of creating a brand um, for businesses downtown who would be willing to participate in this composting initiative um, through the city. Um, and then my group was a third group and we were doing the residential side of the composting. Um, so we got a lot of, we've submitted a survey um, to the town um, that they distributed. And we also distributed um, via just knocking on doors and handing out surveys um, and com submitted a, so this, I guess, survey, we collected a lot of data. Um, 231 that, responses, which was the most any of my classes have ever done. Um, yeah, so we actually had a, the city post it on their Facebook page. We went door to door with physical hard copies of the survey. Um, and we were basically just trying to gain knowledge on what people are currently doing with their waste, um, if they're, are they composting? Would they be interested in composting? Um, and if they were interested in composting, what could Blueprint Geneva do to help with their um, curbside pickup from a residential standpoint? Um, so we actually got a lot of interest. Um, we got a lot of people that, a few people that signed up for the service because of um, our surveying. Um, and Blueprint Geneva is still offering the service. Um, and part of it too- It's much more widespread residentially now as partially as a result of Eric and his team's sort of efforts at getting word out. Um, I use, I have a bucket and I have for a long time they get picked up, but I, there are so many more people on my street um, now than there were a year ago when we were um, starting this project out. Yeah, so what was really interesting for us too is not only getting people on board with the composting initiative, but just kind of um, creating a basis of knowledge for composting because that is the part that is the part of the waste stream that goes into the landfill and causes um, these odors that you smell and the decomposition of organic materials. Um, and it was also we also did a little work with um, a place called Tanaka Castle, which um, is helped run by an alum. Um, closed loop systems in Seneca. Yeah, cool. okay, so it's called Closed Loop <laughs> Systems in Seneca Castle. Um, his name is Jacob Fox. Um, he's an alum. I'm not sure. I never went to school with him. He's probably graduated in 2014 or 15. 14. Um, so we did a little work with him um, in the vermiculture um, decom uh, organic um, material decomposition process, I guess, um, and the city of Geneva has a grant to 
possibly put in some vermiculture trenches for composting purposes. So that was definitely one of the highlights of my environmental studies career is working on that project. We, I felt very accomplished at the end of that project. So it was and nice. Well, he should have. Eric worked very hard. I remember a couple of times when we were trying to get things finalized, I'd just be like, Eric, help. And he would just show up and we would sit down and kind of um, push the data because um, as, as Eric said, like they had an amazing success rate on getting responses. And I'm used to my students getting maybe, I don't know, 50, 75 responses, but 230 um, responses was quite an accomplishment. And so we spent a lot of time kind of thinking through it. Some of the, the lessons um, that kind of came out of it for me in terms of what consumers knew about composting was a lot of people were putting like um, cardboard and paper into the recycling bin. Um, and all of that waste essentially could go into this compost process because composting needs a certain amount of green to um, brown material. And we actually found a pretty important intervention point in terms of consumer education. Um, and so we're continuing to work um, Blueprint Geneva on sort of trying to figure out how to address some of those gaps in knowledge. Yeah, so kind of going off of that, that's one of my experiences in the environmental studies department working with you, Robin. Um, but could you talk a little bit more about the curriculum and, and other options the student have, students have to pursue um, their specific interests? Sure. In the so the first thing to keep in mind is um, HW and yeah, I get nervous even on camera. HWS. Um, offers an environmental studies program. Um, and so um, that's a little different than uh, kind of our traditional environmental science program that um, a lot of other schools have. And the reason we do it is it, it tends to be a little bit more interdisciplinary. So when it comes to courses, every student will take an intro of some topic or another. Eric, what was your energy? Uh, yeah, I was in McGee's um, intro to energy. Okay, and so I teach the one on biodiversity. Um, there's a the, another one on water, um, and then we have a whole slew of people teach on sustainability. Um, so we, everybody takes an intro and everybody takes a capstone, which is typically done in senior year, right? Like the thing that helps you synthesize sort of what you've learned in between. But the path that you take to get from intro um, to capstone is pretty uh, um, tailorable in the sense that everybody has to take a couple humanities classes, you know, like English, history, philosophy, um, Africana studies, things like that. Everybody has to take a couple natural science classes. Um, we teach an environmental science class in-house, but we also have biology, geoscience, uh, chemistry, and physics, and then a couple social science courses. Um, the course Eric and I were talking about, the composting project, that was in an upper level social science class that I teach. Um, and uh, and then everybody has to have some type of methods class. And so um, Eric Ta, you're, what did you do? I don't even remember. Oh, you're taking it in the fall. No? Methods? Yes. Yeah, I'm taking it next fall. What okay, so ideally we try to get methods done before senior year. Um, but um, I teach, the one Eric's take, uh, taking is a qualitative research class, which does a lot with learning um, how to observe the world closely and sort of, um, interviewing and survey design, some stuff Eric's actually already done quite a bit of, um, but we also have intro uh, or fundamentals of geographic information systems, so spatial analysis, map making, um, environmental statistics, lots of things like that. And then from there you get four electives um, and there's lots of room to sort of tailor the degree to what you want. A lot of people double major. Um, some of the most popular double majors that work really well together are architectural studies, um, biology, uh, geoscience, uh, quite a few biochemistry and chemistry double majors these days, um, and an increasing number of people double majoring in um, political science or English. Um, and so we've actually got quite a good mix of students with a lot of different interests. And because of the flexibility of the curriculum and sort of the experience that HWS um, offers, you can really kind of, um, it's not quite create your own adventure because you have a few things you have to get through, but you do get a fair amount of flexibility. Would you agree with that, Eric? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now I'm taking a natural resource law class. So that's a class that we're learning out of a book that is geared towards second year law students. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, I'm taking another class currently um, that's on environmental leadership. So we're talking about um, being a leader um, and, and the stewardship that comes with 
um, environmental studies and conservation and things like that. So um, there's a good mix of of uh, classes that you can take and tailor. And um, for me, um, in the architectural studies program too, there's a lot of classes that um, go back and forth. So taking like landscape architecture classes, um, there's a lot of environmental theory and design that goes in the, a lot of the landscape architecture um, and things like that. So there are a lot of classes that you can kind of cater to what you want to do. Um, so after graduation, I ultimately want to go into the field of landscape and environmental architecture. Um, so it's a happy medium between the two, my two majors. Um, so I think the curriculum at HWS really allows you to pursue what you want um, and the amount of classes that you can take um, through the department at, definitely help you um, if you're unsure what you want to do um, there's enough um, classes that you can take to kind of get you interested in in certain things yeah I, I would say because I've taught a series of first-year seminars I did four in a row and working with first-year students and interest I often tell people like part of the beauty of a liberal arts education is sort of figuring out, we, of course, everybody comes into school wanting to know what they want to do, right? But what's equally important um, in the context of HWS is figuring out what you don't want to do, right? Because everybody's going to take a class that um, maybe doesn't excite them in the same way, right? But then there's those moments where you get into uh, a class where you start seeing the connections from all of the classes you've taken before that really get like set you on fire and make you really excited about um, what you're doing. But that, I, for me, that's one of the biggest strengths of HWS is we, through our curricular goals, sort of, we don't force you, but we encourage you really to explore broadly, um, especially in those first two years so that you can get a better sense of where you want to narrow in. Yeah, and it's really nice. This department itself is really nice because Thank you. Um, I have a lot of friends and other majors that um, a lot of the professors and majors like anthropology um, and history, they teach what they know and it's kind of a, a path that you take if you're interested in this one certain thing, you end up in a lot of the same classes with the same kids talking about the same things with the um, oftentimes similar professors. Um, but in the environmental studies department, um, all of your classes are so interchangeable and the professors are all invested in every aspect of environmental studies and environmental science. So you're not actually just following this track of what certain professors are doing. You find yourself with a good mix of um, classes, um, teaching styles, um, learning styles and things like that. So the I department would... is definitely unique. Yeah, just to add on to what Eric's saying is there, are, I think there's seven or eight of us that are in environmental studies these days. All of us have very different interests, but all of us are united by one thing, and that is like the desire to keep learning. So like I often talk to my students, um, I run a fairly democratic classroom these days, um, where, you know, I ask students, okay, so this thing happened, what should we do about it? Like, okay, we got a setback, how are we going to adjust this? Um, but I would say, every one of my colleagues in environmental studies is really open-minded and eager to see the connections between things and i think that's what really sets us apart from environmental science programs at other schools is we as a whole we're we're trained to focus on um, particular types of topics but none of us are actually that hyper focused on things instead we do we do our research and we um, do that sort of thing but we also um, get really excited about how we can work together, or what we can learn from the students, and sort of how do we make the best possible student experience um, by being open-minded and sort of modeling what it's like to think about things through an interdisciplinary lens. Yeah, so I mentioned um, my hopes after um, graduation, and I'm not sure whether grad school is directly in my future or later down the road. I predict um, it is at some point, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see when it happens, whether it's right away or, or if it's a little further. But um, are there any common themes um, for environmental studies majors after graduation that you see, Robin? Yeah, so of course, um, we, we're the third largest major on campus. Um, we're always in the, the top 10. Um, we're growing again. We're in a high growth phase right now. Um, and so, I can speak to primarily my advisees. Um, 
I work with anywhere between 20 and I think I have 64 advisees right now. Um, and what my advisees, a lot of the people that come to work with me are similar to Eric in interests um, in terms of um, design and sort of ecological resilience and that sort of stuff. So I have, I think I have three students working at one um, environmental consulting firm in Rochester. I've had a number of students go on to um, master's programs in landscape architecture or architecture in general. Um, I've got a couple of people working for uh, transportation um, departments out in California. And so there's a kind of this mix between some people go to grad school right away and then enter careers in architecture or community planning fields. Um, but then a, another subset of people who sort of go into the job market um, working in consulting or working for the state or local or municipal um, governments in some capacity, usually something research-based with some field work um, while they build skill sets that they um, want to ultimately you know, change or go to um, uh, grad school for. Um, so my last question, we've kind of talked about this. Um, and the value of liberal arts educations, but could you sum up what you believe, um, how you, what you'd make a case for in a liberal arts program like this? Yeah. There, I, so my pause isn't because I don't know what to say, it's because I have so much to say. Um, I look back on my college career. Um, I was a non-traditional student. I dropped out at one point um, because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do and it took me six years to graduate. And I look at the, the environment in which I finish my, my college degree, which was a liberal arts school, much bigger than this one. Um, and if, if it wasn't for the sort of kind of connections that I formed with my faculty members and with my cohort of peers that I was um, working with, I don't think I would be who I am today because there was something very special about knowing people and getting to actually do real things. Like I went to my first conference and presented at 21. Um, prior to that point, never even thought that was a possibility. And so for me, working at a place like HWS allows me to um, sort of reciprocate the kind of experience I got um, and allows for this, this experiential based education approach, which is like so fundamental to who I am. Like I'm the professor that has people out on the campus farm, like planting seeds to, to grow greens, to, you know, donate to the local um, uh, food pantries, right? Like for me, the, the context of a liberal arts education is its strength is in the, the kinds of connections you form, the flexibility of the curriculum, the, the part that I mentioned before about figuring out what you don't want to do, because that's really important too. Um, but for like, it's all in the sort of the community, right? Like I can walk across campus and see any number of students um, that I've had in class. I mean, I'm pretty good at remembering people's names. Um, like, I love the fact that we can sort of drop by right before uh, spring break, Eric, I heard this like coming up the stairs and Eric walked into my office on crutches because he blew out his knee skiing or whatever. But like, I like the fact that we have that level of comfort where we can sort of um, build, build these relationships and um, maintain them like post-grad. Like I talked to so many of my students that I've worked with still, um, some of them have become such good friends and I'm so grateful for that. And I don't feel like I would have that capability if I was at a bigger school. I don't, is that helpful? <laughs> yeah, I can't agree more. I mean, I was like, you can't the agree. Connections, uh, the connections are amazing. Um, and with all my professors, I mean, Robin's my advisor, so I spend a lot of time with her, but, um, just popping into the office and seeing any of my professors, um, even professors that I've never taken a class with, know who I am because we run into each other all the time and um, we're involved in things on campus. So it's, it's a nice, it's a great community to be a part of. So. Absolutely. Um, so thank you, Robin. Um, and if you guys haven't already, um, feel free to put a couple of questions um, in the chat. And I've seen a couple pop up. Um, so the first question for us, Robin, is how many students are in the environmental studies department? Ooh, um, we graduate. Uh oh, this one I feel like I should have been ready for. Um, well, considering I have 64 advisees and there are eight of us, 
I would say that we're probably well over 200 um, students who are either majoring in mining. I, I tend to have one of the higher um, advising loads for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I would say we're on average graduate anywhere from 50 to 70 a year. Um, a lot of people do come to us late, um, figuring out like, oh, I was gonna do a minor, but it turns out I only need three more classes. I've got these room in my schedule, so how about I double major? Um, and so that does happen a fair amount too. Um, but Mary, I can get back to, and I'm not actually sure how many, but I know that we are growing um, quite a bit right now. Um, another question for you, Robin, I guess. Um, if you're interested in both intro to water and intro to energy, can you take both? So technically, yes, you can. Um, but we as a department only um, require one intro class. Um, and the reason that is, is um, our intro class have all of us work on the same 10 kind of things about skill building and sort of stuff. So while you would get some maybe different topical knowledge by taking two, you would get some repeat um, skill building that we think it's actually better for you to, to choose one of the topic classes and move into and sort of specialize or get that, that breadth um, at our 200 level classes. Um, but I have an advisee right now who's taken, took intro to climate change in the fall and now is doing the sustainability one. And, you know, he's like, oh, it's not going to count. That's a bummer. But he's also glad because he's got another cohort of students from intro that he knows um, as he moves forward towards his major. Yeah, and there are plenty of opportunities um, later on in your career um, in college to take a class that might be a little more um, heavily focused on um, water and the issues surrounding um, water quality and things like that. Um, should you take intro to energy and not want to go back and take another um, intro class, there are definitely possibilities to um, take classes later on. Um, so how does HWS help students after graduation with jobs, grad school, law school, et cetera? I see my cat has joined us. This is Piper. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we have a very strong career services um, program that does a lot of work with students in terms of resume building and matching to internships. We also have a guaranteed internship program. Um, and so I can't speak to the specifics on that, but I know that students I've had that have gone on to work in the environmental sector will often send us ads about needing or wanting interns and we'll sort of connect them. One of Eric's, um, uh, he was an uh, architectural studies, sustainable community development minor, um, did some, an honors project on a on local streetscape, sort of designing a street to be uh, more accessible and inclusive. He now works for the company that he partnered with on his honors project. So we have a lot of alum connections that work out really well. And of course, the faculty are always happy um, to serve as references and look over, you know, grad school applications and that sort of stuff. Um, because we really like, we are as a whole really dedicated to seeing everybody um, get the most out of this and supporting them wherever their paths take them after school. Yeah, the career services is, is a big part in helping everybody later on. Um, there's a lot of faculty members that are, um, I don't know exactly what their titles are, but there are faculty members who um, chair these kind of sub departments so like the pre-law department um they're called pre professional programs okay so the pre-professional programs they're professors that are um kind of assigned or volunteer for those positions to help advise students who are going into certain fields if you want to go into the field of um, law or pre-med um, yeah. things like that so some of those post-professional um, careers have specific um help that they get yeah. from Dedicated Professors advisors and, and the faculty as yeah. a whole know, like if you're interested in law, send them to Brophy. If mm -hmm. you're interested in pre-health, send them to Scott McPhail, right? Like um, those resources are pretty, pretty easy for us to, to pull up. I work with, I don't know how this has happened, but um, I, I actually work with a lot of students in health professions. Like I write anywhere from two to three letters for um, people to get into med school or osteopathic medicine school like every year um, because a lot of the students who do go on to the natural sciences are quite interested in health professions. Um, your friend Matt, for instance, Eric, um, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. and so they, they still have room like 
to take things, other things they're interested in, um, rather than just like hyper focusing on the natural sciences. Right. Um, so the next question is, what resources on campus, such as green spaces in the lake, are utilized um, by the Environmental Studies Program? Um, I want to make a so, big claim here and say pretty much all of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that why you're shaking your head? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different places on campus that we use. Um, I know a lot of the geo department uses the little streams that run through campus. They do yeah. um, studies on like parking lot runoff. Um, so even the spaces that aren't green spaces, like the parking lot and the turf field, um, a lot of geoscience and chemistry departments are using even those places around campus to conduct um, research and surveys and things like that. Yeah, the thing I would say is like um, environmental studies, we as a faculty sort of see the campus and sort of the city of Geneva as a living laboratory. So um, I am one of those people, and I'm sure many people on the call are the same, where like, I don't like I don't mind being in a classroom talking about things right but like where it really comes to life for me is out doing things and so you know like I don't I we use the the spaces of the campus as ways to experiment with the things we're talking about um, I you know we've had a campus farm for the last few years which has been a huge part of the environmental studies program we constructed a small greenhouse there we've grown lots of food um, we've used it for food preparation that sort of thing um, we do have a boat called the William Scanling that um, some of my colleagues in environmental studies do I'm not an aquatic sciences person um, myself I'm, I'm a more you know terrestrial plant person, um, but uh, lots of opportunities on the lake. Summer research here is just an absolutely incredible, I don't know if it's like 100 to 200 students a summer or something um, who apply to work with different faculty um, who get the sort of experience of collecting and analyzing data themselves. Um, and those opportunities are readily available. Um, for me, I think a lot of students don't always take care, uh, advantage of those opportunities, but um, there's definitely a lot of opportunity for sort of engaging the, with the campus um, in data collection and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I would say, and Eric, you can chime in about this, that the project you're doing with Jeffrey right now, um, is that downtown, we have um, the Bazuto Center for Entrepreneurship, um, uh, the Sustainable Community Development which program, which I'm chairing, which is kind of the environmental studies I, we're still figuring that part out. Um, we actually have our physical space downtown with our drafting tables and our supplies and everything. And so the Bazuto Center for Entrepreneurship located 22 Castle Street, right, right in the middle of the city, um, provides us a good anchor point into the, the community so we can guess, have guest lectures or go out and actually like physically walk around and um, collect um, data and that sort of thing. Do you wanna talk about your project? Uh, yeah, so for the sustainable community development um, minor, um, I'm in the capstone class. It was originally going to be um, co-taught with Robin and um, Professor Blankenship, um, who are actually both my advisors. Yep. Um, so we originally were working with the city of Geneva and some of the planning board and planning committee um, to help redesign some of the streetscapes in Geneva that had issues with um, sightline problems, traffic problems, speed issues, um, so a lot of times um, professors will reach out to the community, reach out to the city, or vice versa. The city will reach out to um, professors in certain departments and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Um, we'd love to get a little more research, gain some research, gain, gain some perspectives from the community. Can you guys um, help us out? Um, in this instance, um, Sage, who is the city um, director, her, she's a city manager. Um, so we've been working with her um, to redesign and come up with some alternatives to streetscapes, um, creating um, more visibility on streets, um, deal with some parking issues and stuff. So that's, that has to do with um, the development, the community development aspect um, yeah. to create safer, safer roads. Um, Eric, do you know if we can, can I screen share? Yes, I have the ability. So to I'm just going to pull up. So this is a sustainable community development program. I this picture of me is very interesting. Um, but what I wanted to sh highlight is what Eric's talking about is we've done a lot of these different projects. 
um, that um, focus on sort of uh, Finger Lakes areas. And so one of the more recent ones that Jeffrey and I taught was, and so this is our final report from the class, right? So it's professional level products, something you can walk into a, a job interview with and really sort of talk about what you're doing. Um, but we did a project looking at the Castle Street corridor. Castle Street runs from up by the Cornell Agricultural Station past my house and downtown into the lake. Um, and so we looked at um, a section of this uh, area and talked sort of about what we could do differently. Um, and so from this project, a couple real, like in terms of real world things emerge. Um, we proposed that the library, uh, okay, let's, well, let me back up. Burn Dairy is currently redesigning. We recommended, right now Burn Dairy is located in the front part of this lot. We recommend that they push back and I like physically just walked by this building on Monday. It is the exact shape that we proposed, except for it's over here and it's a little further back. Um, and then the, so you can see some of the professional level products that we're creating in our classes. Um, and then the library, um, there was a building that was not being used next door. And we recommended that they purchase that lot and expand um, their space. And they have done that. Um, and they're currently, they're putting in a parking lot, which is not what we recommended. But um, our, our sketches and things like that were used in the grant funding proposal that the Finger Lakes or um, the City of Geneva's library used to actually secure the funding. So one thing I want to keep stressing and something that environmental studies is really dedicated to building is these, these hands-on experiences where you get out of the classroom and you go out and you try to do things. Um, a lot of our communities around here don't have a lot of, you know, there's not always a lot of resources. So having a, a group of um, 15 students and a professor sort of hive minding on how to troubleshoot the problem can often be the first step towards securing that grant funding or making that change that allows the communities to feel um, more resilient and healthier. Yeah, so over, overall, I mean, the whole city, the whole community, even the region is basically our classroom to answer yeah. that question. <laughs> we use everything from, we go and um, take field trips to the local landfill, um, all the way over to some of the um, separate properties that the colleges own and have access to. Um, so we use the whole, the whole lakes, the whole Finger Lakes region um, to do surveys, to conduct research and survey and stuff. Yeah. Um, Sorry, so, on the juggling table, that would be a cat. <laughs> Who's now on uh, a computer because that makes sense. <laughs> um, next question, how competitive are classes and research opportunities? Yeah, so Registration is like one of those things that there are some people who seem to have really good luck and then some people who just never have good luck. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have enough classes or anything like that. There are always more than enough seats and classes than um, we need. It's just the, um, I think the, the challenge for a lot of people is being open minded in what you take. As you become a junior and a senior, right, like you're, you're already declared your major. So if there's classes with seats um, dedicated to majors, right, you have sort of a, an easy endpoint. Um, it can be harder for first years and sophomores in the sense that they may, they may really want to take environmental law, right, um, because they know that they want to do something with um, law and the environment, but they may not be able to get into that class until, you know, junior year, not because we aren't offering it, but because seniors and juniors who wore the very same sophomores a few years ago are now um, in that class. So what I would say is my department is very um, cognizant of uh, making sure we have enough seats for people. So like Eric said, I was supposed to be co-teaching the class with Jeffrey when we found out it was gonna be a smaller group. I went out of co-teaching and opened up a class with another 25 seats in it. Um, and so we're kind of constantly paying attention to those enrollment things and being as responsive as we can. Um, because the last thing we want is for students to get like locked out of classes. And I think that's, that's like, a good sentiment across the faculty across the board because you all are here and we want to give you the best opportunity we can. So while I can't say we can guarantee that there, there are seats in every class, I do know that we as a faculty work really hard um, to make sure in the advising process to be wise in sort of what we're recommending, but also to be responsive um, to, to what student need is. Yeah, there's a little bit of strategy involved um, with registration in the first two years, I'd say, definitely freshman, um, first year and sophomore year. Um, 
there, it's a it's a it's a little bit of a struggle to get classes, but it being liberal arts education, you have these other criteria that you need um, to meet by the time you graduate. Um, so you can get your art goal out of the way. Um, if you're an environmental studies major, you can get um, maybe your qualitative or quantitative research uh, methods out of the way, um, things like that. So there, there are things that you can do to get ahead before you have access to necessarily every single class that you want. Um, but there are definitely opportunities. Um, and even taking a class that you might have no idea you could possibly be interested in could um, lead you down a path to finding something that you're really passionate about. Eric, uh, what, for me, do you have an example of a class that you, you took, but you weren't necessarily like super excited about that you actually are super glad for now? Yeah, so last fall, or this fall, I guess, 2019, um, I took a class. The title of the class was just gentrification. Um, didn't really know what gentrification was. Um, did a little research to figure out if it's something that I would be interested in taking. Um, and it, it amazed me how um, well it tied into um, environmental justice, um, and how well it tied into my architectural studies major. Um, so sometimes you just find a class that you could see yourself taking, saying, that it's, oh, it's pretty interesting. Um, maybe I, I'll try it. And that was one of the classes for me that um, I wanted to just try. There's open seats available. And I said, pretty sure not? I probably pushed you towards that one, didn't I? I think you did, or that might've been one that I picked out and you were like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta do that. You gotta do that. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually really happy. Um, I had an amazing relationship with the professor um, and a lot of those upper level classes when you get older to be a junior and a senior, um, a lot of the final product of the classes are re your own research papers, your own research projects. Um, so that class actually ended with a little bit of a research project that I took as um, a little bit of an environmental studies route um, to check, to see what's going on around my hometown, um, one of the lakes that I live near um, and the gentrification that's going on and what that's um, creating from an ecological perspective and um, a lake health perspective. Um, so even taking those classes that you don't think you necessarily would enjoy or you don't think that they'd fit in um, with your major or minor, um, just gaining new perspectives from classes like that is so, it's very, so beneficial to your learning. Um, yeah. So definitely don't get discouraged, I would say, no matter where you are from taking something that doesn't initially seem to interest you because it will fit in with what you want to do I promise yeah and the one thing else I wanted to add about classes is um, there so um, you know the students who are going to be sophomores just registered yesterday I think but what you need to know about if you're you, you're coming in as a first year student is we always reserve a ton of seats so like I have I don't know 30 seats in my intro to biodiversity class and I think 20 18 of them are reserved for incoming first year students. And so we're very careful to make sure that we provide breadth and the number and types of classes that we have um, for new, newly um, uh, matriculating students. Um, yeah, and so there's a lot of care and concern that goes into the sort of logistical planning of all of this um, that's sort of behind the scenes. And I think Eric's point about not getting discouraged is important. Um, liberal arts educations are not places you come to specialize from the get-go. Um, liberal arts schools are where you come to explore, um, to learn, to collaborate, and act. Um, and so there, yeah, there's, I mean, everything you do is a learning opportunity. It's whether you embrace it that really makes the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, so our, we don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, so two of the final questions. Um, are professors easy to access outside of class? Uh, yes. From my perspective, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you could just be walking by and poke your head in somebody's office and they're there, um, whether it's their office hours or not, if the door's open, you're always welcome to 
go in, um, some professors, um, first day of classes, they'll hand out their cell phone numbers and say, if you need anything, text me. Um, my One of my classes, that's almost how we communicate all the time, is through a group chat on iMessage. Um, so that's, it's nice, the connection that you make with these professors and they're always available. Um, Robin, when I send Robin an email, I usually get one back within 25 minutes, no matter what time of day it Unless is. Unless it's after 9 p.m. because by then my brain is turned off. I'm usually in bed by then. So long I play oh, on my day Oh, see, well, Eric so. and I are on the same schedule, so it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, I would say we all spend a lot of time in our offices too. And so if you're, you know, I've had people come in just cause they're, I don't know, having a funky day and they just needed to see another human and be reminded that like, you know, everything's all right. Like you got these things going on and it's good. And so like, it's not an unusual thing to be sitting in my office, plugging away, doing my own thing and have somebody like Eric pop in just to sort of check in. Um, and so I know the environmental studies department's in a house. We have like a whole house with a porch and a garden and a kitchen and a shower. <laughs> like we, we sort of have a much, I think, relative to some of the other academic buildings, we have a very sort of home, homey feel to the offices. And so students tend to hang out and kind of pop by different people's offices to say hello. And I mean, all of us love that's like, that's why I'm here for sure. Yeah, so if you guys aren't looking at the chat, um... Kate uh, put in the chat a link to the first year seminar options. Um, so you guys can look at those. Yeah, let me plug. Um, so the environmental studies program for the last six years has um, led the sustainable living and learning community. And what it is is a group of FSEMs that are paired together. Um, they have individual teachers anywhere from two to four professors um, each semester. Um, and we teach the same curriculum. Um, and then we get everybody together for um, one common period a week um, to kind of, uh, like I said, hive mind on sort of um, different ideas. And so there are always um, uh, environmentally uh, themed FSEMs, but if you are really into this stuff, what I um, recommend you look for, it's, I'll just put it in the chat, it's called, yep, that's a specific link, cool, um, for the SLIC program is what we call it, S-L-L-C, um, and if you have questions on um, the SLIC program, you can feel free to reach out um, to, to me or to uh, Tom Drennan, who is sort of like the person who's been doing a lot um, with the program as well. And that one of the best things about Slick is everybody sort of lives together in the same residence hall. Um, and so our research, which I said I've been leaning on on this stuff, um, indicates that students that go through the Slick program are more socially connected and feel more supported um, than um, maybe might be possible at other schools. Um, so if you're really looking for sort of a built in community around the things you're passionate about, um, the SLIC program is a great opportunity. And a lot of other um, first year seminars are uh, learning communities. So you have lots of options in that regard. Robin, I just put both of our oh, yep. um, emails in there. Um, I think I got your, I think yours is Lewis. Yes, right? it is. Lewis, it I, is. When I got okay. here, it was the only Lewis which is so hard for me to believe. So both mine and Robin's emails are in the chat. Um, feel free to reach out to us with any questions you guys might have. Um, Anybody wanna... in admissions can also get you in touch with me. And as Eric says, we communicate pretty regularly. So if you wanna follow up with him um, and you, don't, you can't find his email, let me know and I can get him on the line for you. Sounds good. So thank you everybody. Thanks for joining us and thank you, Robin. Yes, of course, thanks Eric. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, best of luck for all of you making your final decisions and um, hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody.